This week, New York Times bestselling author Ruta Cepetis talks about writing historical fiction, including her new book, The Fountains of Silence. An author has nothing without readers, but for me, I have nothing without these humans who are brave enough to let me tell their story. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. And good morning, everyone. It's morning, wherever you are. <laughs> Our guest today is Ruta Sepetis, and she is a fantastic author, uh, internationally acclaimed, uh, number one New York Times bestselling author of historical fiction. And this book is a page turner, so give yourself plenty of time to read it, my friends, because you're going to want to know <laughs> what, what happens at the very next page. Now, she is considered a crossover novelist as her books are read by both teens and adults worldwide. She is passionate about the power of history and literature to foster global awareness and connectivity. And um, she was born and raised in Michigan and now lives with her family in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, this is a fantastic book, as all of hers have been. It's just... Uh, <laughs> and the title yes, of the there. book is The Fountains of Silence. Welcome to Writer's yes. Voices, Ruta. Thank you so much for having me. So this is, I believe, your second time with us. We, yes. Yes, we interviewed you about the salt and the sea, or salt to the sea. Um, which was a World War II novel set in um, the area that's now, or that was known as Prussia. Is that correct? Or Yes, East yes. Prussia, East which Prussia. is now Poland. Okay. And now we're going to Spain, and we're post-World War II. Now, the main difference, I think, between this book and your earlier books is that the earlier books were based on some family history and this one came to you a different way do you want to talk about that a little bit sure um, and that's absolutely correct um, that my other books had threads of my personal family history so I could write those books so to speak from the inside out but I am not Spanish um, and so I had to write this book from the outside in and the way I came to this topic, um, as you mentioned, my books, um, thanks to Penguin, are published in over 60 countries. And when I was touring Spain for my first novel, Between Shades of Grey, the Spanish people, they were so compassionate and so full of empathy for the hidden history in my book and also the people who experienced that history. And it made me, you know, want to reciprocate. And when I asked about the history and their history in Spain, you know, Civil War and post-Spanish Civil War, they said that it was too complex for an outsider to understand. But more importantly, they said it's just too painful. And because I have Baltic history, which is also painful, I understood that. And it really inspired me to look a bit deeper. Why is it that we know these names like Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini? But we don't know much about Franco, even though he, you know, ruled for 36 years. So that was really the spark that, that you know, made me interested in wanting to learn more about the Spanish Civil War and the post-Civil War period in Spain. You certainly uh, bring that out. And I had no idea. I had no idea that, that, that these things were going on in, in the country. And I'm sure, I'm sure no one, many people don't, you know, they don't realize we're we're so involved in ourselves and our own country and we don't even think about what's happening around the world. So these these books that you write are really uh inspiring to me and I hope to many people. Oh, that you means so much. Yourself. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you thank you. Yourself. And also right and now this is an opportunity I think that historical fiction particularly has and also um, just such a wonderful thing that you are doing with this podcast because some studies show that history now ranks dead last as a major in colleges. Kids don't feel it's an employable major, so students don't pursue history. Oh, my goodness, what happens if we lose our historians? And what happens if we lose these definitive texts that are written by the historians? Um, classes now are becoming history classes, much more general. But with historical fiction, we have an opportunity to examine 
um, you know, perhaps what some might consider a more obscure piece of history or more specific piece of history. Um, and that's, you know, so readers, together with readers, we're bringing this history out of the dark, and that's something I'm super passionate about. Well, if, if, we, don't, if we don't remember our history, we're doomed to repeat it. So well said, exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we have to be aware of what, what went on so we don't do that again. So, Ruta, did you study history in college? I did not. Um, I've always been a storyteller, but I haven't always been an author. Um, prior to becoming uh, an author, I spent 22 years in the music business, helping songwriters and artists and musicians tell their stories, but through music. My degrees are in international finance and international management. Um, so uh, I, I, I came to writing. Uh, I know that always gets a laugh at events. I'm like, oh, so do you have a, is, is it your degree in English or is it in creative writing? I'm like, no, it's in international finance. Um, but, but honestly, that groundwork, working in the music business, really helped me as a writer. What do I mean by that? Well, um, your listeners, they might not remember one thing I say today on, on this show, but, you know, tonight they might turn on the radio and hear a song they haven't heard in 10 years, and they can sing every lyric to that song. And that's because melody and rhythm – make things memorable. It's powerful. So that training ground for me in the music business, that really helped me as a writer. Um, I'm a rhythmic writer. Um, I'm, I'm writing by feel. I read my work aloud, listening for rhythm and flow. And so I'm trying to take these obscure historical topics and apply a rhythm to them. Um, yeah. And so, and so, yes, my degree is not in, uh, in English or you know, or writing. It's in finance, but I'm making my way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ruta, I just wrote down four things that you said that could be like the lead quote for my promo on the show. So that was pretty amazing. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad. And, you know, honestly, I can't, I'm so terrible. I can't remember what I said. Sometimes people will say, oh, could you repeat that? And I said, actually, I can't because I have no idea what I just said. <laughs> well, that's okay. We have it recorded. Yeah, right. Perfect. <laughs> well, the, the way this the way this book is the reason this book is is so interesting and e and it's easy to read is because of the way it flows, and the way that you have the, the chapters are short and then you're wanting to know what's going to happen next in the next chapter because it's about somebody else and so then you you know there's then there are the, the characters are all interesting but there's not too many of them and that's important. If you get too many characters in a book, you lose track. But here you, you you have the threads of all of them as they as they interwine and it it really makes it makes it enjoyable to read. Thank you. And those characters, um, they're so important to me for many reasons. First, I write historical fiction, so I have to stick to settings, dates, you know, times. I mean that's the history. I can't alter that. So really my creativity comes with the characters. And when I approach a piece of history, I want to give a balanced portrayal. Let's take this book, The Fountains of Silence. It's set after the Spanish Civil War in Spain. So I want to represent um, the Francoists, the people who were supporting the dictator. I want to represent the people who suffered under the dictator. And I want to represent the outsiders who were coming to Spain unaware that so many people in Spain were suffering in silence. And so that's how I chose to sort of build those characters. Yeah, well... And so you have it, it, one. It, it comes through. Yeah, and you have one main point of view character in each of those camps. You've got Daniel as the outsider coming to, from Texas. Mm -hmm. You have Anna as the one who suffered under Franco, and her cousin, Puri, as the one who was supporting Franco. Now you also mm -hmm. do go into the to some other points of view, like Julia and Antonio and so forth. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you decide what point of views to write from and um, and how to balance, as you're writing, how to balance the various points of view. Um, uh, definitely it, it's from a starting point of emotion. Um, when I'm doing these interviews with countless people, um, I research and write at the same time. My fear is that, let's say I'm sitting with a human being, who, you know, endured this, was a Spanish Republican, endured this lottery of life or death and survived. 
and the interview is charged with emotion. They're crying. I'm crying. I fear that if I step away and, you know, just sort of archive that until I start writing the novel, that I'll lose some of the immediacy. And my feeling is that it's the emotional truth that brings the reader to the page but keeps them to the page. That's the emotional truth is, is what we relate to, that we say, oh, I feel this. Not, I'm not just reading it. I feel this. So as I'm interviewing people, after the interviews, I step out and I, I write dialogue longhand. I write emotional beats, which is also something I learned from the music business, writing beats. So I'll write the emotional beats. And that's how the characters start to appear. Once I look at my lists and my beats, I realize how I can represent these different emotional experiences, these different emotional threads, and in doing so, hopefully represent um, a larger representation of human experience during the time period that I'm writing about. So we have Daniel Matheson, you know, outsider, son of Texas oil baron. We have, you know, Julia and Anna. Um, and then we have other characters. You know, we have an American newsman. We have um, two of my favorite characters, Rafa and Fuga. These were based on interviews I did with elderly men who were young children during the time of the Spanish Civil War, Civil War, forgive me, and their parents were executed. And when some of these uh, parents were executed by the regime, their children were taken to what were called homes, boys' homes. And I learned th these were not homes at all. These places, they were a slaughterhouse of souls. And what these boys experienced in these homes was so horrific and yet some of them they survived and it was miraculous uh and 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 what they told me their suffering was their greatest spiritual teacher and some interesting things so i wanted to represent that so if anna and daniel are let's say the heart of the fountains of silence the characters of rafa and fuga are the soul well i found interesting too that you um the one character was it Fuga wanted to be a Toreador? Yes, he wants to be a bullfighter because back then yeah. um, bullfighting was so popular in Spain and, and called such respect. It didn't matter uh, what the, the blood that was running through you. It didn't matter which side it was on. If you could stand in front of, of the bull, um, that in everyone's eyes, it, it lifted you. It, it, you were transcendent. You were, and so these young boys, this is their, the way for them to rise is through mm -hmm. bullfighting, and they have dreams of being bullfighters. It's kind of the way out yeah, of the ghetto. Yeah. Exa yes, yeah, that's yeah. a great way to put it. it you yeah. know, exactly, yes. I think in and of course, he had to overcome, I mean, a great deal of things to, to get there, but he was, he was determined, and so was his friend. To get him there, and that uh, that connection between those two, I thought was really, really beautiful between those two boys. Oh, uh, thank you. And that is, those are based on real stories and real young men who experienced that. Um, and at a uh, recent event on my book tour, I happened to be in San Diego, and one of those men um, who was a model for one of these characters came to the event. And it was so emotional for both of us because I write the books, but they're not my stories. You know, history writes my stories and they belong to these human beings um, that, that are generous enough to share their story with me. And someone took a picture as I am clasping the hands of 90-year-old Antonio Fernandez. And we're looking at each other and he is thanking me for telling the story, but I am thanking him for, you know, for putting his inspiration into the world. It's, it's really magical. An author has nothing without readers, but for me, I have nothing without these humans who are brave enough to let me tell their story. I bet that was, that was some experience. Oh, golly. Yeah, I was going to Oh, it was that. incredible. Yeah. You you had a lot of you just had a book tour and it was you had a lot of cities, and did did you get a lot of, of a lot of interesting questions or how did people react to your to your book? Oh, thank you for asking that. I I did, and one of the most common questions was, why do we not know more about this? Why do we not know more about Spain? Um, Franco was a dictator for thirty six years, and people. Um, I, I think that was the, the most surprising and then the, the other was 
oh my goodness, when I read your book and realized that during the dictatorship, all of the Western European countries, no one would have anything to do with Franco and the dictatorship. But there was one country that was, the United States. And so people at the, at the tour events, they were fascinated to learn how I had discovered that and what did that mean. And, and so we had some really good conversations. A little bit. I really like the way that you at the, uh, excerpted um, um, quotes from this oral history of the United States government's interactions with mm-hmm. Spain during that time period. Can you? Where did you find that information? How did you find it? And how did you? Dis- why did you decide to use it in this way? Sure. Well, for me, research is like being a detective. I, I spent seven years working on this, this book. Um, and as you can imagine, just went through mountains and mountains of, of research. And when I discovered that the United States was doing business with the Franco dictatorship, I wanted to know how and why. Well, it turns out that in the 50s, um, Spain plunged into poverty. Franco had isolated the country to the extent that now they literally people were starving. So in the in the 40s and then now come the 50s, they they signed the Pact of Madrid and Franco decided to allow the United States to put a couple of military bases in Spain as a position against the Soviets in the Cold War. So we had the United States there. Then he allowed the Texas oil barons to drill for oil. He allowed the Hollywood movie studios to to make movies in Spain. So we had Frank Sinatra and Ava Gardner and Marlon Brando. And so originally, my search was for information about those topics. Why was the United States in Spain? But when I got into the presidential archives and I got into the news archives and the oral history archives of the diplomats who were actually there, and when they gave their exit interviews, and sometimes a decade or two later gave a a recollective sort of interview, oh, my goodness. The information was so illuminating in some cases. It was so shocking in others. Um, you know, some of the diplomats were very badly behaved and had no problem speaking of it. And I thought, <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow, what if I take these excerpts and I, I insert them into the manuscript to give the reader an idea of what was going on behind the scenes? And this was particularly fascinating for my publisher in Spain because they, this is their history. They know their story. But what they didn't know is what the U.S. was saying behind the scenes. So I think it was fascinating for the Americans. And now it's fascinating for the people in Spain um, to see this. And, and I had so many more that I could have put in. Um, And my goodness, this was, I mean, some of the stories were so salacious. Oh, Ava Gardner lured a bellboy into her milk bath, and um, <laughs> Frank Sinatra threw a fit. Threw a fit when someone stole his case of toupees, and he broke a window. And this, this was such great stuff. But then, because I write historical fiction, I need to ask myself: Okay, what serves not my story? What serves the history? And so how I chose those excerpts, I asked that question, what serves the history? And that's where I decided where to put them in and which excerpts to put in. And I've already received emails saying, no way, these aren't real, are they? They're absolutely real. And the information, it's the truth. (laughs) You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. And our guest today is Ruta Sepetis, author of Fountains of Silence, The Fountains of Silence, sorry. Um, so how are those things, you know, I know that you do a lot of research, but is that, are they like available on the internet or did you have to go to the Library of Congress or presidential libraries or how did you actually find them? Uh, some I found on the internet, the, um, oral history, the diplomatic oral history archives are online. And so when I'm, I'm providing these in the book, you see the source. I even list the website that people can go to if they want to see it themselves. The presidential papers, th- those were presidential archives, um, that I went in and, and looked and, and researched state archives. Um, I have, I applied and, uh, received official research credentials. Um, you know, from the country of Spain, so I could go into uh, the library in Madrid. 
and uh, and also very interesting for me as a writer to see how archives differ uh, from one country to the next, from one city to the next. All the rules are different. And so before I do my research, I always have to know um, how much time do I have? Will I be in a cubby? Will I be allowed to have my phone? Um, are gloves required? If so, are they provided? Because if I don't show up in Europe with gloves and the approved type of gloves, <laughs> Perhaps I can't touch the material, and then I've traveled all the way there, and I don't have it. So there's a lot of research that goes in just to preparing to do the research. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Well, what I'm wondering is how do you keep track of all this research? I mean, because you had so many, you know, there's just so, so many different things there, so many different paths. How do you keep track of it all? If I were wise, right, and I've been doing this now for uh, I've written four books over 10 years, right, if I were wise, I would use a program such as Scrivener that allows me to house all of my clippings, all of my um, research, and have my text right in front of me, be able to move things, but perhaps because I am, I compare myself as a writer to, let's say, a musician who plays music but doesn't read music. Because my education, my formal education, is not in English or writing uh, or creative writing, um, I do this by feel. And my husband tells me all the time, this is nuts. This is absolutely <laughs> nuts. He works in, in data and IT. He's like, let me organize this for you. But I keep, I, at, the, at the beginning of every, when I start a new novel, I open it. I have a journal. I have a new journal. And that's where I put all of my research notes as I'm researching, reading papers, and then I save my different clippings and oral history reports, photos in various folders on my computer. But that research journal is sort of like my mothership for the project. And by the time the book is actually done, that journal is a book in itself. That yeah. journal shows you exactly how I wrote this novel. Um, and so I'm, and I'm going back and reading my research journal, like, like it's a book. It's like something I've, I've written throughout and, and then taking pieces and saying, yes, I know I need to use this and where I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it here. And, um, but I, I do it by feel, which is crazy. <laughs> so are you taking notes in that journal by hand? Yes, by hand. Everything, all the, that journal is, is handwritten and, um, there was a, a one bookstore, Barnes & Noble, that decided to do an exclusive edition of The Fountains of Silence, and they asked me for like 15 or 20 extra pages of bonus material. And my publisher, when I said, oh, here are some options of what I could send, they said, oh, my gosh, you do this by hand? <laughs> they said, that's so <laughs> yeah, ar yeah. archaic. It's so archaic and old school. And, um, and I do. But so in the back of this particular edition, I was able I, – I put – um, all of my scratch notes, like if I'm on tour, on a book tour, and I'm in a hotel, I might take a piece of hotel stationery. Well, I had that with sample titles of the books. I had dialogue that I had written after interviews with, you know, with the true witnesses. And, and so all of that was put into the book. But it was a reminder to me and, and really enlightening to my publisher. Um, they're like, do you need some help with this? <laughs> Can we help you? <laughs> <laughs> so, Ruta, as you're doing this research, well, first of all, do you have the the outlines of the story that you're trying to tell already firmly in place before you start digging in like this? No, I have a loose outline. First, history beautifully provides my, let's say, a skeleton or um, like a scaffolding because I, I know – I have certain dates that I know I need to hit and I know, you know, for example, when Franco dies and I know, you know, so that I have that sort of uh, architecture, um, thanks to history. And then um, as I'm interviewing, as I described, I'm, I'm coming up with the characters. Who is, who are going to be my storytellers here? Who, who's going to help me tell the story and share this history? So then I create the characters and then I have to decide what relationship do the characters have? to one another and what are the storylines and the plot lines and 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 is someone going to fall in love and sometimes young readers they ask like oh you know I love um the love stories why do you choose to put um love stories in all of your books well in doing all this exhaustive research and meeting with human beings there there's a couple you know universal truths and 
One of those truths is, is love, that even amidst war and brutality, people were forming bonds through shared experience, and some were falling desperately in love. And I include that because, as you know, I mean, history can be really, really difficult. It, it can be sad. It can be tragic. But I don't think that we should ignore the other side of it, that it can be full of hope and heart and show us the, the miraculous nature of the human spirit and the force of life. So as I'm doing my loose outline, I'm looking for those opportunities. And, and also, I'm totally a romantic sap. Where can I put a love story in? So I'm looking Ooh. for ways to pull a love story in. Now, as you're doing this research, you must run across other stories that don't really fit into the scope of what you're doing. Is it difficult to like stay focused on the story that you're trying to tell and not go down the rabbit hole after all these other fascinating cons stories? Oh, uh, it's it's a great <laughs> question, and it it happens so often because each of these pieces of research, I'm convinced, could be a novel unto itself. I mean, absolutely. It's, it's so, I mean, Ava Gardner's bad behavior at the Castiana Hilton and that thirteen thousand dollar check she wrote thirteen thousand dollars in the fifties. For damage to her hotel room. Yes, that's a novel right there. So, um, <laughs> oh my gosh. And, and this, this happens with every book that I write. I come upon these topics that I over-research purely it, like out of self-indulgence because I, I'm so excited and I want to know more. So I, then I have all of this extra research. And there's, I'll explain the, how, what I do with it if I can't use it in the book. And this book, The Fountains of Silence, is a good example. Um, when I was reach, uh, researching uh, World War II for Salt to the Sea, I, I looked at the photography of Robert Kappa, the photographer, um, and who was just an incredible um, war photographer. And I became so enchanted with Kappa, um, who this name Robert Kappa was, you know, a name he made up just to sell photographs to American news agencies. He was really Hungarian. Andre Friedman was his name. And I became very fascinated with his story, but I realized as I was um, researching him that some of his most powerful work was done in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. And he, he's very highly regarded in Spain. So then when I started the Fountains of Silence and I was going through and building my plot and putting this together and putting together this very loose outline, I thought, oh, Robert Kappa. Yes, I can pull Robert Kappa in. And so although I wasn't able to use Kappa in Salt to the Sea, I could use that research. So I always tell myself, okay, um, don't go overboard, but don't, don't worry that this is a waste. It's not a waste. It, it's not because uh, somehow like I go searching for story and then the universe responds and story comes searching for me. And that's what happened. And, and that thread of that Robert Kappa photography it came searching back. It came, like a boomerang came back to me and said, "Hey, Rudis the Petty, you can put this in." And um, and so that was that was really really great. But that happens all the time. There are things, and as we discuss, I need to ask myself what serves the history, and that's how I decide what I put in or what I toss out. Well, I can understand why I enjoyed this book so much because I'm a musician, and so oh. I could feel I could feel, I, I've been playing piano since I was five years old, and I can. Feel, I could feel that, that that pulsation. That's why I enjoyed it so much. I know that's what it was. Uh, well, you said something that was just such a compliment. You said that that it was a a quick read that you could get through it. That it's and and I really I try to work on that. People, um, we have very limited time these days, and there are so many things that are competing for our time. So if I'm giving someone a 400 page book on the post Spanish Civil War boy, I better make it compelling. I better bring them to the page and keep it there, keep them there. And I do that um, through, I, I try to do it through rhythm and flow. I read my books aloud again and again, um, and mainly to cut things. I'm, I'm a, a rewriter. I'm not a writer. And so I'll, I'll read my books aloud, and then I will take out um, pieces and words and threads and and say, okay, wait, I, I can't use three words. I need one word here to represent, you know, and that way I, I'm short sentences, short chapters. Um, and to, to be quite fair, you know, some people, it, it doesn't appeal to them. They feel that the rhythm is a bit too staccato and, and that they can't sort of get 
you know, lost in, um, you know, in, in the book. Well, it, it's a different well, writing I got, style. I got lost. I got lost in the book. <laughs> I just want. It to is a different writing there. style. Yeah. Then, then yeah, what's? But I, but I like that myself too. And, and in too. fact, I think I tend to write more that way than to go on with. The Do book. you? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, and I've gotten some criticism for it too. So, um, yeah, and yeah. some people do criticize, but I do find that if I'm reading through and I say to myself, um, oh, oh, I really like that sentence. I think, oh, really? Do you? And that's your ego speaking. There's something <laughs> you like about that. That doesn't mean it's going to be good for the reader. Ooh, you like that as root of the writer. Okay, you know, let's get your ego in check. And generally, I'll end up throwing out those sentences that I feel, oh, that was lovely. <laughs> That reminds me of that quote from William Faulkner, in writing, you must kill all your darlings. I will tell you, if I don't kill my darling, um, someone else will, because I uh, have been part of the same writing group for 15 years, and my writing group, they see everything first, before my agent, before my editor, um, before my husband, before anybody, and they are so tough on me, and I love them for it. Sometimes I'll leave the library where we meet, and I'll sit in my car and I'll cry. Because they, they've told me, this is, this is not your best. You know, actually, this is a disaster. And I think, oh, oh no. no. And, and then, so, so some, I lose some of my darlings there. And then it goes to my agent. And my agent has been my mentor for, you know, oh, so, so many years. And, um, and then he'll give me feedback. And then it goes to my editor. And my editor, if she wants to kill a darling, that darling is going to be dead um, because she, she really sticks to it. And so I think, oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great relationship because she has a very defined idea of what she wants. And from working in the music business, it was a very collaborative business when working with songwriters. We were collaborating. We were writing something together. So for me, I love that. Some of my writer friends, that would not work for them, that type of editor. But so my editor will really hold my feet to the fire and say, I told you previously that this wasn't working, and you know what? It's still not working. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, Ruta, why don't you read a little bit from the Fountains of Silence? Okay, and I, I have to preface this um, by saying that I, you know, when I, I read my work, I, I never imagined that I'm going to be the one reading it. So mm. please you know, forgive me if I if I if I stumble um, a little bit. And the other thing that might be interesting for um, your listeners to note, because I think it might be different than other other authors. Once I write a book, I mean, I am all in. I'm 500 percent in for you know seven years on this book. But once it's done, it's done. I I never go back and read my books. I had two for one. My first book, Between Shades of Grey, was made into a film, Ashes in the Snow. And they were asking me very specific questions um, about the, the book. And I thought, oh, wow, I need, I need to read this book, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I went back and I read it. But so I, I haven't read or read from the manuscript for probably a year and a half because, you know, you turn in a book and then it's, um, you know. Right. Uh, but I think that's just me. I have many friends who, who do read, reread, you know, through their book. But I'm going to read a section um, that's following one of the main characters, Anna. And Anna is the daughter of Spanish Republican parents who were executed by Franco during the Civil War. She lives with her sister, Julia, and Julia's husband, Antonio, and, and Julia and Antonio have a little baby, and their, and their brother, Rafa, is one of these boys who wants to be a bullfighter. But hanging over this family is a constant shadow of fear. Um, they are not and were not Francoists, but now, you know, they've been pushed into silence. So Anna is going to visit her sister. Her sister makes um, is one of the seamstresses that makes the suit of lights for the bullfighters. So we're picking up the story uh, with, with Anna. Anna walks down the narrow cobblestone street. The swallowed note is gone, but a taste remains. I know what you've done, the note said. She looks over her shoulder before slipping through the unmarked door. At the bottom of the darkened stairway, a soft light pulses beneath the entry. She pauses to listen, then pushes through the door. A rainbow of color bursts with greeting. Glistening bolts of silk and satin climb from the floor to the ceiling. 
Shimmering fabrics in sea blue, deep amethyst and gleaming gold cascade across worn countertops. Sketches and patterns are pinned across the walls. Three women sit at tables while two others work heavy material through machines. Anna bends to retrieve a small pearl from the floor. In this snug space, ceremony is created. The beautiful fabrics and jewels are not for party dresses or wedding gowns. They are created and used for one person only, El Torero, the matador. He wears the suit of lights, named because the gemstones and beads sewn onto the fabric reflect and sparkle as if operated by a hidden switch. One suit is comprised of countless pieces taking months to construct, each detail completed by a different person. The workshop, generally full of chatter, is now devoid of voices. This means that Luis, the master tailor and owner of the shop, gets a matador in the next room. Anna's sister Julia sits on a wooden chair in the corner. A lamp rings a halo of quiet light into her lap. She pushes a needle through the rigid seven-layer fabric, sewing one of hundreds of sapphire gemstones onto a cropped jacket. Julia's fingers are silent narrators, embroidered with scars. Anna pulls an empty chair to her sister's side. She retrieves a small pair of pliers from a nearby table and sets a hand on her shoulder. Finish with these, whispers Anna. Your hands, they'll bleed soon. Julia nods gratefully, accepting the pliers to grip the needle. Anna motions with her head toward the fitting room. Which bullfighter stands behind the door? Ordonez, Julia whispers. Anna looks to her sister. Julia's face, thirsty of color, needs rest and sun. Julia has a new baby girl, just four months old. The baby is not yet strong. Neither is Julia. She clings desperately to the child, and together they cry through the night. Fascist doctrine states, that a woman's ultimate destiny is marriage, motherhood, and domesticity. For poor families, like theirs, hunger turns a blind eye to mandate. Many women from impoverished families take positions of manual labor. But Julia is special. Her talent as a seamstress affords her the opportunity to work in a shop. Luis needs Julia's skills to please his matadors. Julia needs the wages to feed her family and pay their debts. We must pool our earning, reminds Julia's husband, Antonio. All wages and coins shall be deposited into this old cigar box. To move from an impoverished Vallecas to a small flat in Lava Pie, this is the plan. Julia rations and counts everything, pinching every last peseta. For now, four adults and a newborn baby share a dark, single room, but they are together which is what their mother wanted. Anna has no memory of the war, but she remembers the tears of separation after her parents disappeared. She remembers crying desperately the day she left to be raised by her aunt and uncle in Madrid. Though her aunt and uncle have a daughter of their own, her cousin Puri is different, obedient. Puri is free of heartache and shame, free of secrets. Anna envies her. How was your palace today? Julia asks. Oh, lies and threats, but don't worry. I swallowed them, thinks Anna. Oh, oh, the same. Ice and more ice, says Anna with a laugh. She tries to redirect the conversation. Um, I'll be on the seventh floor for the summer. I'm assigned to a very wealthy family, staying through August. They have a son about my age. Julia nods. He's from Texas, says Anna. He has American magazines. Julie's expression shifts from fatigue to fear. That hotel is not real life, Anna, not for people like us. Julia, it seems unbelievable to us, but for them, it's real life, says Anna. American women, they drive their own cars and fly around the world on airplanes. It's not considered sinful. They don't need permiso marital. They can seek employment, open a bank account, and travel without their husband's permission. Julia glances over her shoulder before whispering, Anna, please, Stop picking through trash in the hotel rooms. Stop reading those books and magazines. 
you know very well that the content is banned in Spain. This is not America. Julia is right. In Spain, women must hear to strict subordinate roles in the domestic art. Anna remembers the teachings of the section feminina. Do not pretend to be equal to men. They also teach that purity is absolute. Women's bathing suits must reach the knees. If a girl is discovered in a movie theater with a boy but no chaperone, her family is sent a yellow card of prostitution. Julia's brow buckles as she reaches for Anna's hand. Even her whisper is unsteady. The world at the hotel is a fairy tale. I'm sorry, Anna, but that is not our world. Please remember that. Be careful who you speak to. And that was Ruta Sepetis speaking or reading from The Fountains of Silence. Ruta, how much time did you spend in Spain researching for this book? Well, um, the idea for the book came in 2011, and then I went back every year, um, uh, every year, and I'll go back again this year. And, <laughs> and the, research con the research continues. Um, and what, what does that mean? Well, I, I was going back and forth. I rented an apartment in Madrid for a time period. Um, I, the book is set in an old hotel, the Castellana Hilton, and so I stayed. It's now the Intercontinental, and the staff there was just so incredible to let me stay there and let me search the archives and wander the halls at 3 a.m. like a, like some sort of lurker. And <laughs> um, But this is where the story really came alive, you know, to walk the path that I could, where I could really feel my characters, you know, so I could describe them then to the readers. So, um, but I say the research continues because um, I'm writing about time periods that I did not experience. And uh, I'll tour Spain early next year. And when I go, very likely and hopefully there will be readers who will point out um, errors and then we will correct them for subsequent editions. I worked with two researchers, um, one in Copenhagen, Denmark, who is a professor of Spanish um, history and literature, and uh, one in Madrid who is uh, uh, a, has a doctorate in, in Spanish history and specifically specialist in the Civil War, Spanish Civil War. And then I also worked with my interpreter, um, I have had the same uh, interpreter, Marta Armengol Royo, for years, and uh, not my translator of the books, but my interpreter when I'm there. She is my voice when I am in Spain because I don't speak Spanish. And Marta worked with me side by side. Um, and so as I was sending stuff to my writing group, I was also sending it to Marta, in, and she lives in Barcelona. And together we were going through this. So that was also part of the research process. Um, and some of the things, um, Marta is – much younger than me, she had to research herself mm -hmm. to say, oh, is that correct? That doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a huge process, but um, uh, a, a writer friend of mine, she once told me, you know what, writing is a team sport. And she was so right because I'm working with a writing group, I'm working with research partners, I'm working with research librarians that I've met throughout the years as I tour. Um, I have beta readers, young teens who over the years have said, oh, I would love to read an early draft of your book. Well, you know what? Here you go. Let me know what you think. Um, I have lots of early readers, um, and, and that helps me so much because I'm so close to the story. I'm sure it's the same way with your writing. You know, you, you know the story, and you know the story you want to tell, So, but sometimes it's hard to know if you're actually telling that story mm. and executing it because so much knowledge we, we have so much knowledge in our head, but maybe we're not showing the reader. We're not conveying it to the reader. Maybe they don't feel a sense of place. So those beta readers and those early reads are so important to me. So you say you're touring Spain. Are you going to some places that you haven't been before? Well, because I've toured Spain so much over the years, I've been fortunate really to, I mean, to really travel the whole country from Catalonia to Basque country, you know, down through Bilbao and San Sebastian and, and up through up even the Biarritz area. So um, no, I won't be hitting any new areas, but hopefully I'll be meeting with some new readers. Mm -hmm. I'm considered what's called a, a crossover author. Um, my first book, Between Shades of Grey, um, was published in the United States as a young adult novel. But when publishers around the world picked it up, some countries picked it up as an adult novel. And one of those countries was Spain. And so when I went to Spain for my first novel, Between Shades of Grey, I was meeting with adult readers. And then through bloggers and booktubers, some young readers and teens discovered my books. And, and so now I'm also a crossover author in Spain. So I think it'll be really interesting 
to see what the teens, you know, the teens, what, what they feel about this versus the adults. And it'll have some really beautiful, create some really beautiful conversations with, let's say, 17-year-olds who, you know, weren't alive during this time period, talking about the book in, let's say, a bookstore setting or book club environment with adults who experienced the Spanish Civil War and adults who were on both sides. So I, first of all, has The Fountains of Silence been published in Spain already? No, not no. until after the turn of the year. Okay, all right. So I'm in, it'll be interesting to see what kind of response it gets. Um, mm -hmm. I actually went to Spain when I was 17 for a month, and right after Franco died, so 1976. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting because we were, um, it's sort of the country had been under military rule up until that point in time. They were getting a little more freedom. Um, we were advised by our the faculty advisor to be very, um, some more demure in dress than we would have, than we were in the U.S., you know, not to wear shorts, uh -huh. not to, you know, wear um, tank tops things like that um, uh -huh. but and and also I'm had very long very blonde hair I uh, attracted a lot of attention because a lot of people had had not seen a lot of we were oh. mostly in Tarragona um, which is south yes, of, south yes. of Barcelona I've been there. and I we did go to Madrid and and some of the other places too but most of the time was in Tarragona and I think not uh, people there had not seen a lot of uh, Western Europeans or n Northern Europeans, you know, so the blonde mm -hmm. hair was very um, uh, attention getting. I actually remember sitting on a bus and suddenly feeling like a pinch on my head and realizing that the man sitting behind me had pulled out a piece of my hair. <laughs> <gasps> You're kidding. <laughs> I did not oh react. I did goodness. not say or do anything. But um, yeah. <laughs> oh my good. So, but so, and what was your takeaway from that time in in Spain? Was was it that the country was in transition? It was difficult. Did it feel like a hostile place? Did you feel welcome? Uh, I felt welcome. It, it it did not feel hostile, but it was a little bit. Um, it was a little bit too much attention sometimes. I, I'm not yeah. really liking to be that much the focus of attention. I, I have a funny um, bullfighting story too. Uh huh. <laughs> when we first we first arrived and we were staying at a college campus outside of the city and we didn't really know how to get into the city. There was a bus, but we so the first night we wanted to go to it was a Saturday night. We had been there like one day. We wanted to go to a the bullfight that was supposed to be on Saturday. Maybe it was Sunday. I can't remember, but there was the bullfight was that night of the week. And so, of course, when you go to Spain back then, you had to go to a bullfight. So, so the, there were five of us. Three high, three of us had just graduated from high school, and then two older um, girls who were. One of them was our guidance counselor, and the other one was a college age girl. So we decided to. Um, we were going to go into town and try and see this bullfight. And we go stand at the bus stop, and the buses just keep passing us by. They're all full. Nobody stops. So eventually um, our guidance counselor convinces us it's okay to hitchhike into town. <gasps> <laughs> so we did. and uh, But we got separated. And we said we would meet up at the fountain because as we had been driving on the bus from the airport, the day before, we had seen this fountain. We thought it was like a central meeting place, and okay, we'll meet mm -hmm. at the fountain. Because, and however, we couldn't get the guy that picked us up to drop us there. And and eventually, but eventually, we did find each other because there was a large paseo, and everybody was out walking. It ended at the cliff at the Medi over the Mediterranean, and everybody was walking up and down that. And so we ended up finding finding the other two. This was before cell phones or anything, you know, so if you got separated, there was really no way to find yes, your friend. Right. And and so we're trying to figure out where the bullfight is, and we get accosted by this group of young men, and we're saying, tell us, we want to go to the bullfight. Where? How do we get there? Where is it? 
and they tell us, mostly through gestures, partially through words, that we should not go to this bullfight. It was not a good one. All the bulls had little horns. Oh. <laughs> I see. I see. So instead, we went to a nightclub with the, with this group of guys. So, and there's more to the story, really? but I won't go into that. <laughs> just oh, I don't think you let's just say we listening. did make it back to the campus. <laughs> But it took some effort. <laughs> it was not. Oh my good! Easy. There is a novel in that story. <laughs> and was your guidance counselor still with you at the nightclub? Yes. Uh, you know, it turned out she was only like twenty-four, and oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So um, she was not acting as a guidance counselor. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> like, well, and um, you know what, though, sometimes that's how those life experiences. Um, and, and I'm you, obviously it's the same for you. These life experiences they inform our writing. As we're working yes. on a project, yes. we call back to what does it like? What what does it feel like to be lost, alone, afraid, vulnerable? Um, those are our emotional truths and grounding points. And so that journey, we'll call it, <laughs> or escapade. <laughs> yes, um, escapade. You know, the escapade. <laughs> You know, that, that's what makes you a great writer because you have life experience and you know what it feels like to be a little concerned and frightened on the streets of Spain. Yeah, so that's yeah. wonderful. And then there was the group of um, American college students that was with us, um, boys, who decided to go to Pamplona for the running of the bulls, and one of them ended up with a broken leg. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> But boy, if you're going to do it, you know, oh, I broke my le leg once. How? Running with the bulls yeah, in Pompona. Yeah, wow. Exactly. That's impressive. <laughs> That's impressive. So, oh, well, thank you so much. So, Ruta, um, I don't know that much about the roots of the Spanish Civil War. And in fact, pretty much all I know about it was that Hemingway was somehow involved in it. And there were Americans who went and fought. Now, were they fighting with the Republican side? Yes. The Abraham Lincoln Brigades, um, Americans who went over to Spain to fight against fascism. Um, and that's why there were some Americans there. And the Spanish Civil War started as a military revolt against um, the democratically elected Second Spanish Republic. And then it became this armed conflict between the nationalists, you know, Franco, and the Spanish Republicans. Um, so it was, uh, you know, a, a fight against fascism. Uh, the Republicans were fighting against fascism. And Franco was aided by Hitler and Mussolini. Um, and the Republican side, they were led by the Democratic government at the time. And then they were aided by Mexico and the Soviet Union and volunteers from over 50 countries. Um, and those volunteers, they, they were uh, academics, creatives, um, workers. There were some, you know, leftists and and really, the Republicans were internally sort of divided, and they weren't able to stop the nationalist advance. And so then they, they surrendered in March of 1939, and then Spain plunged into a dictatorship that lasted 36 years. So how did Franco manage to keep power when, you know, we all know what happened to Hitler and Mussolini? Uh, because, um, remember, this was like a precursor to... World War II. So the Spanish Civil War took place 1936 to 39. Well, then, you know, there was all this conflict and, and World War II was going on. And then after World War II, you know, there was the Marshall Plan and this rebuilding and, you know, and Franco had quietly, you know, a, assumed power and held on to it. And the people in Spain, the Spanish Civil War was so devastating. I mean, brother against brother, you know, and families were the pain was just indescribable and people were tired and they didn't want any more pain and they didn't want any more war um, and war was going on all around them. And so Franco came to power and actually, you know, held power in Spain partially by isolating the country. Um, as I might've mentioned, the train tracks in Spain were purposely a different width to control the flow of entries and exits. And by isolating the country, look, you've got no freedom of the press. The people in Spain have no idea what's going on in France or Germany or the United States. Um, I mean, to some extent they do, but, but not really. Textbooks are written by the government. So then the younger generation is sort of indoctrinated into um, Spanish fascism. Uh, 
so yeah, and that's that's how it how it works. So Spain stayed out of World War Two. Yes, Spain remained neutral during World War II, and much to um, Hitler's chagrin, there was a very famous meeting where Hitler came to Spain and met with Franco, and Franco had a way of communicating um, without communicating, meaning he he w- wouldn't commit to anything. Um, and this was evidence as I was reading throughout his legacy, and um, that that was he would meet with people, but there there was no progress. Franco was doing what he would want to do. And so he met with, with Hitler and Hitler laid all of these things on the table. And, and Franco said, great, let me, let me go back to my people. And just then that was it. I mean, mm-hmm. and um, which was upsetting to Hitler because Hitler and Mussolini had helped Franco during the Spanish civil war, um, you know, and, and with certain bombing missions and things like that. And so, yeah. So they and Spain he, remained and he neutral. expected a quid pro quo oh. and didn't get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Wow. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And of course the kind of the underlying story of the Fountains of Silence has to do with the um human trafficking essentially selling babies. And Correct. when did that story actually come to light and how long did this go on in Spain? The the trafficking well and it, there were several different um, periods of these stolen children. Initially, after the Civil War ended in 1939, the stealing of babies was punishment. It was um, it, it was like this re- retribution um, for families who had opposed Franco during the war. Then, as the years progressed, Franco was trying to build what he deemed a pure Spain, noble Spain. And in order to do that, he wanted to rid the country of what he considered the red gene, the degenerate gene that was the Spanish Republican faction. So in order to do that, um, aided by doctors and nurses and um, and hospitals and orphanages, uh, there were some women who, when they gave birth to their baby, they were told that their child had not survived. When in reality, the child was stolen and gifted and sold to uh, a family that supported Franco, a Francoist family. And then in later years, it even continued into the early 80s. Um, and I was told that from these groups that I met with and researched that at that point, it purely was a trap, just a trafficking operation. So first it was a punishment, then it was this, this to rid the country of the, of the red gene, and then it was just trafficking. Um, and it's the estimate, it's really unknown how many children were stolen, but th- there are estimates of 200,000, 300,000, um, and many people still have have no idea and it plants a seed of doubt in terms of identity um and of course after franco died uh the country adopted what's known as the pact of forgetting it was just too difficult that they thought we're going to plunge into another civil war if we try to prosecute 36 years of alleged offenses Mm -hmm. and so they agreed to forget and And what happens when we forget history yeah they they were going to move on and so uh, babies that were potentially stolen. This wasn't something that was talked about because they had adopted the Pact of Forgetting and other reasons. That's not just the only reason, but yeah, it wasn't spoken of. And a lot of those children didn't even know they were adopted because the mo- the mothers, the adoptive mothers, would pretend to be pregnant. So. Yes. Some, some they told me, would wear a pillow um, for months and months. Um, there was a woman who worked at a medical clinic and the parents who were supposed to adopt the baby had a crisis of conscience and said, um, "This is first they said this is a lot of money and I don't know if this, is, if this feels right. And the doctor went to the receptionist at the medical clinic and said, oh, I have a gift for you. Here you go. And in later years, that woman, you know, told her daughter what happened, that no, you were intended to be sold to someone else and oh. you were gifted to me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, yeah. Well, Ruta... This is a fascinating subject. We've only scratched the surface. Obviously, you spent seven years researching and writing this book, so there's so much depth to it. But we are out of time, and I want to thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me and giving me this opportunity to discuss what I think is an underrepresented part of history. And I'm, I'm grateful to you because, you know, look, every nation has, uh, wounds and painful history and every family has wounds and painful history but maybe with the buffer of time um, historical fiction and, and these you know books will allow us
to look at history from a different altitude. And if that happens, oh, I so hope that maybe we can get to a place where history no longer stands between us, but maybe flows through us. And that's the power of books, I think. So I'm so grateful that you would have me on your show. Thank you. And Mom, do you have some closing words? In your book, love is there. And love is like a butterfly. It goes where it pleases and pleases where it goes. (laughs) That's beautiful. See you all next week on Writer's Voice.